Whether to run databases in Kubernetes is one of the most asked and debated questions. From my perspective, the answer is yes, if you do not want to use a managed service and if you already migrated other stuff to Kubernetes. Hence, you're experienced with it and if the type of the database you want to run works well in Kubernetes. Now, I will not go deeper into the discussion whether to run DBs in Kubernetes or not. Instead, I will assume that you already decided to do so and that you're looking for a way to do it. If that's the case, I have a potentially interesting project that might help running databases in Kubernetes. Bear in mind that I did not say PostgreSQL in Kubernetes or MySQL in Kubernetes. I said databases in Kubernetes. Plural. So today we will explore how to run almost any database in Kubernetes through an open source project called -da -da -da, Cubeblox. Cubeblox claims to be the cloud native data infrastructure project. That tagline suits it well, most of the time. We will discuss why I do not believe that it's there 100% yet. Actually, not being completely cloud native might not be a bad thing. It might be a good thing. We'll see. As for the data infrastructure part, take a look at this. That is the list of add-ons currently supported by Kubeblox. There is Redis, Pulsar, PostgreSQL, which is the one I will use today, MySQL, MongoDB, Kafka, and so on and so forth. If you need to run something related to data, it's almost certainly supported by Kubeblox. If it isn't, you're probably using some obscure or deprecated data-related solution, so you might want to debate with yourself whether you should be using it in the first place. Now, some of those plugins are already enabled, while others are waiting for you, you, to enable them. Each of those that are currently enabled are a separate cluster definition, and we can list them all by retrieving them with uh, kubectl. So kubectl get cluster definitions. You'll see soon how we reference those definitions when defining a database cluster. Each of the cluster definitions can contain one or more versions, which we can list with kubectl as well. We can see that, for example, five different versions of PostgreSQL are currently supported. And speaking of PostgreSQL, let's take a look at the definition I prepared for this demo. With Kubeblox, we always create a cluster resource. I'm not sure I like that though. I believe that it would be better if there would be different resource definitions for different databases. And in this case, I would prefer if I would be able to define, let's say, PostgreSQL resource. That would simplify observability. And more importantly, it would provide a clear schema through which I would be able to discover what I can and what I cannot do with a specific database. Nevertheless, Kubeblox decided to create an umbrella definition which references other cluster definitions. In this case, I'm specifying that I want to use PostgreSQL definition and that the version number should be 14.8.0. Those two references are the same uh, or the names of the resources I listed earlier. And the rest is the definition of the spec of the component we choose. In this case, I'm not specifying anything special. That's the name, the reference to the component definition, the switch policy, whether I would like to monitor it, how many replicas I would like to have, and finally, how many resource limits and requests should be assigned to it. All of those should be self-explanatory, except maybe, just maybe, switch policy. So what is it? Well, let's take a look at the documentation and find out. Actually, I'm using it as an excuse to show you how good or bad the docs are. So if I go to the home page of the documentation, I will discover that there is no search, so I cannot easily find what that is. Okay, that is not the first time I see docs without search. Let's see whether it is documented inside the pages dedicated to PostgreSQL. And it does not seem to be there either, unless one cleverly figures out uh, to change to the kubectl tab where switch policy is present in the example, in the example, but not explained anywhere. Now, you might say, hang on, 
that's the example and not the specification. But if you look below, you will see that some of the specs are there, but not all, and certainly not switch policy. Further on, there are no links to the rest of the specification either. Eventually, if you do not give up, you will reach API reference that does contain the information about the switch policy, and you might deduce that NOP or NOOP is one of the three values that can be used. What I'm trying to say is that the information is there, but not easy to find, and often not intuitive. If you're watching this channel for a while, you know that I could not live with myself without finding things I do not like and complain about them. So that was one of my complaints. Docs are not good. Now, let's move on and apply that manifest and get all the Kubelux clusters in the A-team namespace. We can see that the cluster I just applied is creating. That will take a few moments. So let me fast forward and try again. I'm running a local kind cluster, so it might be slower than usual. So another fast forward and still creating and there we go. The PostgreSQL cluster is now running. Now, as you can probably guess, we apply the custom resource, which in turn created and manages a bunch of child resources. We can see those if you list all the resources in the A-team namespace, plus the secrets and role bindings and service accounts. The cluster itself is there. And among other resources, it created a stateful set which manages the pods themselves. Unlike some other solutions like, for example, CMPG, Kubeblocks does not have its own solution that manages pods directly, but instead it relies on the native Kubernetes resources such as stateful sets and so on and so forth. Now, having a database would be useless if we cannot connect to it. So we need the credentials in a way that other apps can use them or for us, for humans, to connect to it. The credentials are, as you can imagine, stored in a secret. So let's take a look at it. There's the endpoint, the host, the password, the, the pod, uh, the port, not pod, port, and the username. From there on, our apps can mount that secret and use that data to communicate with the database. Similarly, we, humans, could take the data and decode it uh, to connect as well. Alternatively, you can execute KBCLI cluster connect and that exacts into the container with the database and allows us to use, in this case, psql to perform whichever operations we might need to do. And now that I'm inside the container with the database, we can see that it is based, oh my, hmm, oh, Ubuntu. And that begs the question, why? Why use Ubuntu as a base image? It's big for no good reason. It contains stuff that is not needed. It, look, think of it this way. Containers are not VMs. Use Scratch as the base image or use Alpine or use Wolfie or Wolfie or whatever is pronounced from Chengat. Here's a proof that Ubuntu is not a good choice. I uploaded one of the images that Kubelux uses to my registry to Harbor so that I can easily see the size and, more importantly, the results of security scanning. It is 224 megabytes in size. That's big! But that's not the main problem. There are 300, I repeat, 300 vulnerabilities. 300! And 13 of them are high. Now, I do not blame PostgreSQL for that. I blame Ubuntu. Now, if I take a look at PostgreSQL image from ChainGuard, it is 32 megabytes in size, which is around nine times smaller, and it has zero, and I repeat, zero vulnerabilities. Nothing, nada, nix. Now, to be clear, Kubeblocks is not just an image. It is a Kubernetes operator for managing databases, including PostgreSQL. So I'm not uh, saying that ChainGuard is a better choice since it is only an image and you certainly need something like Kubeblocks. What I am saying is that Kubeblocks should ditch Ubuntu as the base image and use something like Alpine or Scratch uh, or my favorite, Wolfie. Okay. Now that we saw that we can easily connect to the database and that Kubeblocks uses Ubuntu as the base image, let's get out of the container and see how we can manage configuration specific to the database we are running. Now, if you are a 
Kubernetes Ninja. You might expect all the nitty gritty details to be in the CRD, but that's not the case. Kubeblock CRDs offer only the common features like the number of replicas, resource limits, backups, and so on and so forth. When it comes to those database specific features, we need to change the configuration of the database itself. And we can do that with the KBCLI cluster edit config. If you're familiar with PostgreSQL, you should be familiar with what you see here. Those are settings DBAs are used to tweak to make it work as it should. And the list goes on and on and on. There are quite a few of them. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you prefer to manage all aspects of a database through an API, as you would expect from the solution that claims to be cloud native, Kubeblocks might not be the best choice. Now, that does not mean that you should not use Kubeblocks. As a matter of fact, if you're experienced with PostgreSQL or almost any other database, this approach would give you the same level of control you're used to, except that databases are now running in Kubernetes. So you can think of Kubeblocks as being a Kubernetes native way to run databases, but with database specific configuration being the same as you're used to from the past. That probably provides a nice separation between operations and uh, DBA teams. Whether that's what you want or not is up to you to decide. The alternative is to use kbcli cluster configure command to change the configuration. In this case, I'm setting max connections to 200. Now, while I understand the first case where I was presented with essentially the same config file a DBA would use, the option to change it through the CLI is a bit confusing. If Kubelox wanted to give me both the traditional and the Kubernetes native way to manage databases, I would expect that to be a part of the CRD. That leads me back to the doubt I had earlier when I said that I'm not happy having cluster as the same CRD for all databases. If there would be a CRD for each database type, all those database specific configurations could be part of the CRD spec. And at the same time, I would not need to break my use GitOps to manage everything type of rule. Now, let's switch to a more cheerful aspect of Kubeblocks and talk about fault tolerance and high availability or HA. I'm currently running three replicas of the database and we can see that by outputting the YAML of the database cluster. The interesting part is the replication set status section where we can see that the pod indexed as one is the primary while two and zero are secondary. Remember that, memorize it. Remember that one is the primary since that will become important very, very soon. Next, I will simulate failure by storing the name of the primary replica in a variable and deleting the pod itself. Now, let's take another look at the database cluster. We can see that the primary replica now switched to two, while the zero is still secondary and one is completely, completely missing. In other words, the database cluster immediately switched the primary replica to be one of the healthy pods while in the background Kubernetes is trying to bring back the one I destroyed uh, to make it alive again. Now, if I wait for a while, I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I retrieve the database cluster again, we can see that the missing replica that was destroyed, the one that was indexed as one is back. It is up and running, but this time as a secondary replica. Now, as you can expect, there are quite a few other features that Kubeblocks provides. For example, we can define backup strategies as on-demand or scheduled. On-demand, for example, can be defined through KBCLI. Please don't do that, don't use it. Or as the backup resource, and that's the one you want, right? Then there is monitoring with Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, and the Open Telemetry Collector made by Kubeblocks team. We can also manage users, but unlike backups, only through KBCLI, which is a bit disappointing. The interesting part of those and quite a few other features is that they work the same no matter which databases we are using. That is a potentially very powerful feature since it means that we can 
for example, define backup strategy in the same way and using the same definitions for both Postgres and MySQL and whichever other database types we are managing. Now, that's enough of a demo and features overview. Let's talk about pros and cons. Kubelux is a very unique project. It is focused on running databases in Kubernetes. And that's plural, right? Databases. It does not necessarily try to be the best solution for a specific database, but instead to be a good solution for many databases. It might be a great match for those who do want to transition their databases to Kubernetes without removing the control they're used to have. We'll get back to that in a moment when we discuss who the target users of Kubelux might be. For now, let's go through the good and the bad, starting with the bad, with cons. To begin with, documentation is confusing. The order is somehow wrong. After the installation comes the section that shows how to connect to a database, even though there were no instructions in previous sections how to create the database. There is no quick start. There is no search. There are no links to specs in the pages that show examples, and so on and so forth. Now, to be clear, the documentation is not horrible. I've seen much worse. Still, there is a lot of room for improvement. Next, all databases are based on the same schema cluster CRD. That's similar to the problem Kubevela has by treating everything as application. It would make more sense to create database-specific schemas like PostgreSQL, MySQL, and so on and so forth. What else? Oh yeah, images are based on Ubuntu, which is too big for no good reason. And more importantly, it is full, full of vulnerabilities. Next, uh, commands like kbcli cluster edit config and kbcli cluster configure might be useful in a pinch. But I would expect that to be a part of the CRD. It's okay to leave the option to manage DB settings in the same way as DBAs are used to manage them. But if Kubelux wants to call itself cloud native, it should provide a way to manage everything through the API. And that API is Kubernetes API and not KBCLI or whatever the CLI is. Finally, there are better solutions for some databases like CMPG for PostgreSQL. But on the other hand, for some others, Kubelux is probably the best option. So it's here and there. That is the important point we'll get to in a moment. Now, let's go through the good stuff. Kubelux is great for those who manage different types of databases. If, for example, you have PostgreSQL, MySQL, MongoDB, and Redis, Kubelux might be the best option since it provides a consistent way to manage all of them, at least the part that does not involve database-specific configurations. Next, uh, it is great for DB admins who want to run databases in Kubernetes but prefer the way configurations are applied, uh, at least they were applied in the past, to stay the same. Next, uh, common operations like backups, monitoring, and so on and so forth are included and are pretty much the same no matter the database we are managing. And finally, this is a good one, it is open source with the AGPL license. And that's awesome. Now, we can get back to the question about the target user of Kubeflux. Frankly, if you have a single database type that is fairly common in Kubernetes like PostgreSQL or MySQL, there might not be a compelling reason to use Kubeflux. Solutions like, for example, Cloud Native PostgreSQL are probably better. Where Kubeflux shines is the quantity. Now, when I say quantity, that might sound bad since you might have inverse relation between quantity and quality. Kubeflux is great for individual databases, even if there are better options for some but not for all. What I want to say is that its star feature is that it provides a consistent way to manage almost any type of a database. It shines for those who manage multiple databases and want to have a more or less uniform way to manage some operations that are common to all of them, like how to run in Kubernetes, how to make backups, and so on and so forth. While at the same time, still maintaining the ability to manage all database-specific settings in a way DBAs are familiar with. Try it out and let me know what you think.
and thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.